Good morning and welcome to a new virtual investment summit by Fund Society. Thank you all for uh, being with us. Today we are talking U.S. politics with Schroeders. Gonzalo Vinelo, head of Latin America for Schroeders, is going to interview Ron Insana, senior advisor to Schroeders for U.S. politics and economics and CNBC contrib contributor and uh, commentator. So before we start, I want to remind you that this is going to be an open discussion. Uh, at the end of the interview, we will have a Q&A session where uh, we will post your questions. Please uh, remember that you can post your questions through our Q&A uh, button in the WebEx um, event uh, app, and uh, we will share them with uh, our, our guests. You can also send us your questions to info at fansociety.com. You can do it in English or in Spanish. Uh, everything is fine. Um, so before we start the interview, I want to uh, say hello to Gonzalo. Gonzalo is a great friend of Fun Society. Schroeders has been uh, working with us for a long time. And before we start, I would like to ask you uh, if you can uh, talk a little bit about Schroeders' position in Latin America. Thank you, Alicia, for inviting us. Um, yes, Schroeders is among the leaders in Latin America. Uh, currently, we've been in the region for a very long time. For example, the Argentinian office was opened in 1934. And since then, we've been working in Latin America, you know, in different kind of businesses. Right now, we have, we are covering the region with four offices, uh, Argentina, Chile, that covers the Andean Pact, Brazil, and Mexico. And we are considered among the leaders because we have local businesses that we are doing pretty well this year, especially in Argentina and in Brazil, as well as uh, we are among the leaders. We are, for example, number one among the pension funds in Chile um, and, you know, in Peru and Colombia. So, yes, it's being, you know, Schroders has a strong presence in the region and we hope to keep on growing. Thank you very much. So now uh, we can uh, ask Ron to join us, please. Hello, Ron. Hello, good morning. Thanks for having me today. Good morning, um, Gonzalo. The floor is yours. Thank so you. if you can <laughs> please uh, start the interview. Okay, Ron. So for as, as Alicia, Alicia said, uh, Ron, he's senior analyst and commentator for CNBC, former hedge fund manager. So he has been with the boots in the ground for a long time and he knows what is all this about. And for Stuck in the ground, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And for a couple of years, he has been advisor for Schroders in, in matters related to politics and economics. So helping Schroders to understand the environment, mainly in the U.S. and how the U.S. affects the world. So I'm very happy to have you here, John, uh, Ron. Thank you, thank you very much. So as you know, I think that there, you know, it's a right time of the year in order to start speaking about okay, what's what's going to, you know, what's the next stage of the market cycle going to look like how the U.S. is going to affect, you know, the, the U.S. politics is going to affect the, the market environment, the geopolitics, and basically the political scenario about, you know, how, you know, the Senate, the House of Representatives, and the government are going to act going forward. So the title of the interview is about back to the normality. Well, what do you, what, what's your view about, what's your opinion about what is back to normality going forward? Well, I, I guess, Gonzalo, anything as close to the pre-pandemic environment as we can find. Uh, insofar as there is hope, uh, a light at the end of the tunnel, if you will, that's no longer from an oncoming train, that, that the vaccines uh, thus far that have been announced, and there have been three, uh, Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, and now uh, AstraZeneca. We don't know enough about AstraZeneca to, to determine whether or not it has the same efficacy rates as the other two, which are above 90%. But we do know that there are vaccines coming, and we know that by the middle of next year to, let's say, summer, we may well have eradicated uh, the coronavirus, or at least brought it down to levels that it's no longer a major health risk and a major risk to economic growth going forward. Having said that, um, we're also going to see, uh, if you will, some normality in the political arena insofar as a Biden administration um, may very much be like a no drama Obama administration insofar as we won't be necessarily moving from tweet to tweet on an hour or minute by minute basis. The markets may not see the same type of volatility 
you know, barring unforeseen circumstances. And then, and then beyond that, you know, we will see some return to normality as far as our business lives are concerned. But in each and every case, there are going to be some important differences relative to what we knew in 2019 uh, once we hit the middle of next year. And, and our, our work lives, our personal lives, and even our political lives will be different in some ways, but we'll be freer to go about our business than we have been for the last eight or nine months. So you mentioned something quite important in terms of how of how the Democrats are going to manage, you know, the government going forward. But inside the De Democrats, there is a huge dispersion between the right and left. So how do you see Biden kind of dealing with that kind of range of ideology inside the, the, the party? In a certain respect, I don't think he has to. I mean, I think the composition of his, his cabinet thus far, uh, which also includes now today the likely announcement that Janet Yellen, the former ch chair of the Federal Reserve, former head of the Council of Economic Advisors, will be Treasury Secretary designate. Um, I, I think, and, I, and I, it's, it's interesting, I've had an ongoing discussion with the actor John Cusack, who is very, very far to the left, and we, we tweet at each other from time to time about radical change versus um, restoring the infrastructure of government, which I believe is what the Biden administration has to do first and foremost. Um, and again, if you'll pardon this, I don't mean it necessarily as a political um, proposition, but the Trump administration really left many, many jobs unfilled, uh, required jobs within, let's say, the State Department or other parts of the government uh, that are currently unfilled by career professionals who take care of, of business on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, the Biden administration has three things it has to do when it starts. First, fill all those jobs and, and restore the infrastructure of government so it's far more functional than it has been. And then 1A, of course, is dealing with the pandemic, making sure that vaccine distribution uh, is both rational and efficient going forward. And then three, getting relief and stimulus out to the American people as it's required while we go through this winter where we struggle further uh, with the illness. So for those on the left who are looking for an immediate radical shift uh, towards much more democratic socialist type policies, I think they will be sadly disappointed and they'll probably be waved off for a period of time uh, because there's, there's no way to make the leap from where we are to where they want to go without many, many um, intermediate steps. And in fact, we may never get to where they want to go because there's a lot of elements which we could talk about going forward um, that, that may not fit into a Biden agenda, uh, whether it's Medicare for all, whether it's whether it's a whole host of propositions that have been bandied about. Uh, I think Biden is going to be a center left president, not a far left president, as some would have uh, suggested earlier on. Okay, interesting. And what's what, in, in this new environment? How do you think that the Republicans are going to position themselves? Are they going to go to the center, or they are going to keep themselves on the right side? We don't know. So, 71 million Americans voted for Donald Trump, which means that if he remains energized, if he remains out in the public square, if he develops um, some mechanism beyond Twitter for communicating with that group and maintaining their allegiance going forward. That could affect the midterms in 2022 with respect to whether or not the Republicans make any more gains in the House or either hold or take back the Senate, depending on how these uh, two Georgia runoffs uh, for control of the Senate turn out on January 5th. If Donald Trump freezes the field uh, as far as future presidential candidates are concerned, uh, there could be a large clamoring, and many in that group feel that uh, Joe Biden did not legitimately win the uh, presidency, you know, all facts to the contrary. So we could still see a more radicalized Trump party, and then we could see a rump Republican party that tacks towards the center. But I think that's entirely up in the air. We really don't know. And, and, and given that the Republicans' lack of recognition and, uh, of Joe Biden as president-elect, uh, many senior Republicans have yet to refer to him in that manner. Um, it, it tells me that they're not quite done uh, with the Trump agenda and, and may stick by him or stand near him a, a, as we move towards the midterms and, and as, as hard as this is to imagine, start contemplating the 2024 presidential race. Interesting. So going a little bit on the geopolitic kind of field, um, how do you see, you know, the international affairs of the U.S. politics changing going forward, especially related to China, Russia, North Korea, Iran? 
So it's there going to be a, you know, 180 degrees, you know, switch to the other side, or it's going to, you know, keep on going the same trend that we see now? Well, I think it depends, and, and you have to take it on a, I, I think, on the one hand, there will be some 180 degree switches, which is a move from unilateralism towards multilateralism. The United States getting closer to its more traditional allies in Western Europe, Canada, Mexico, um, and, and, and some countries in Latin America, certainly maintaining ties with Australia, New Zealand, and, and, and trying to maintain ties with Japan, which will be difficult given that I think the approach towards China will be from a philosophical perspective, it may be the same insofar as the United States still has an interest in curtailing Chinese ambitions, both economic and military. But that will come in more of a multilateral uh, form than we saw in the Trump administration where it was entirely unilateral. So the U.S. will go to its Western and, and South American and Latin American neighbors and say, listen, China's you know baiting you with presumably free money and and trying to expand their their belt and road initiative that doesn't come without strings and so let's reconnect and let's also force china through the auspices of the world trade organization uh to behave more uh like other members of, of the family of nations that are involved in the wto and and right some of the wrongs that we've seen over the last several years which includes the intellectual property theft forced technology transfer non-tariff barriers and the like whether or not it works remains to be seen the ultimate goal may well be the same to additionally dampen china's cyber uh, activities that have come at the expense of, of many companies outside of china among their economic adversaries and then china has shown some military ambitions in the south china sea and elsewhere that I think Western nations and Japan and South Korea may well be opposed to. So again, we're going to have to strengthen those alliances and come at this from a, a multilateral perspective. More broadly speaking, when it comes to Russia, I would expect a much harder line. When it comes to North Korea, we won't see the type of, of mano a mano engagement that we saw between Trump and Kim Jong-un. In fact, far from it. I suspect that uh, North Korea will be dealt with radically differently now that it's also uh, enhanced its nuclear capabilities. With respect to Iran, I, I, the Biden administration would like to rejoin the Iran deal or the JCPOA, the P5 plus one, however you want to characterize it, in order to uh, halt their current advances, uh, enriching uranium and taking other steps towards uh, functional intercontinental ballistic missiles. So I, I, I'm not quite sure how this works, but our European allies in that regard would like to return to the deal. So I suspect that might be one of the areas that um, Joe Biden goes headlong into, which is to reestablish that Iranian nuclear deal to, to thwart their nuclear ambitions and calm down uh, Iran's adversaries, whether it's Saudi Arabia, whether it's Israel, whether it's um, the United Arab Emirates or anyone else in the Gulf. Um, you, you're seeing closer alliances, for instance, between Israel and Gulf Arab states uh, because they have the same common adversary, if you will, and that's Iran. So I think we will rejoin that process in an effort to uh, tamp down their ability to create uh, nuclear havoc in the region, if you will. So you mentioned two regions. Clearly, you know, something important for us to understand is the relationship between the U.S. and Latin America. I've heard Biden speaking about uh, climate change related to Brazil, especially. So what what is, in your view, um, the, the, the guideline that Biden will follow regarding to Latin America. It's going to become closer considering that China is, is, is very strong at the moment in the region. How, how do you envision that relationship going forward? Well, and this is a tougher one for me to call in the sense that, I mean, first, day one, we'll rejoin the Paris Accords uh, with respect to climate change. Uh, and President-elect Biden has named former Secretary of State John Kerry effectively as a climate czar who will run at a cabinet level position and, and uh, address that is issue squarely. Uh, with respect to uh, relations in Latin America, I mean, obviously the Bolsonaro government was friendlier with Trump than it might be with Biden. Uh, that may well be true with AMLO in Mexico, uh, although that remains to be seen given that his, his philosophy presumably is farther to the left, although we haven't seen a real expression of that yet. And then with respect to the rest of, of, of South America, I mean, where where we're going to repair relations certainly will be on the immigration front and, and uh, allowing uh, 
not just migrant workers back into the country and not just expanding visa programs, but also allowing for refugees who are seeking political asylum to come in greater numbers than the Trump administration would allow. And so that would strengthen relations with uh, uh, Honduras, Nicaragua, Colombia, and, and Central American nations that you know have we've dealt with in the past. Now, obviously, there are some issues we'll have to deal with with respect to domestic behavior in some of those countries, which prompts people to leave and travel through Mexico to come to the United States. But I think there'll be a very active effort in that regard. On the climate front, listen, I think just the U.S. rejoining the Paris Accord will put additional pressure on those nations that might have been reluctant in the past um, to get more involved. Because look, at the end of the day, irrespective of what's going on in the government, technology, green technology is moving at some a red pace around the world and the call for zero emissions between 2035 and 2050 is so strong that I believe uh, we'll continue to see uh, many countries migrate because the, the future of technology is there um, and whether it's you know whether it's Tesla whether it's a whole host of other companies that are bringing both electric vehicles hydrogen fuel cell powered vehicles and, and other technologies um, everybody's going to have to follow suit uh, or, or be left in the cold, not just from a climate perspective, but from an economic leadership and technology perspective as well. Yes, now that you're touching on that, clearly the U.S. and, and China are in the race of you know, technology development. So how do you envision, yeah. how do you think that trade tensions between China and the U.S. are going to be back on the table? Because we haven't... Well, I guess... Been... Yeah, we, we, we haven't... We forgot we haven't about them. Friendly. Well, in a sense, yeah, partly because of the, the pandemic and, and, and the Trump administration's, uh, I guess, willingness, if you will, to, to blame China uh, for the spread of the virus. And, and in some cases, some of his team members suggest that China developed it in the lab and purposely spread it around the world. There have been some obviously wild conspiracy theories around this, and, and people will believe them or not. I think at the end of the day, though, that the Biden administration, um, having had experience in this regard, and, and then the incoming Secretary of State, Mr. Blinken, and, and others, I think will, may certainly not um, use policies that we saw from, let's say, George H.W. Bush through his son, which also included Bill Clinton, the idea of constructive engagement, if that we made China more like us economically, that they would become more like us politically. That's proven to be a failed uh, doctrine, if you will, of constructive engagement, which started under George H.W. Bush. I think there will be a multilateral approach in which the United States, again, strengthens our alliances and, and re-engages with Europe, re-engages with NATO uh, from a military perspective, and brings China, or at least attempts to bring China to heel on a wide variety of issues, using the World Trade Organization as a multilateral arbiter of China's behavior with which we disagree on specific points. Again, it's it's not just intellectual property rights, it's not just forced technology transfer, but it's also cybercrime uh, and, and a host of other issues. And the U.S. has to focus on its own technological development because China is starting to pull away uh, in some areas of, of, of high technology manufacturing uh, and, and separate itself from the rest of the world and trying to entice the rest of the world to move in its direction. Politically, it's going to be, I think, uh, as fraught as it is in the Trump administration. But again, different approach, multilateral as, approach, as opposed to unilateral. I don't think Joe Biden will rely on personal relationships to drive policy as Donald Trump attempted to do without any I think we're, we're going to be in many ways a more cogently policy, specific regard to four of the countries that you named, China, Russia, of course, uh, North Korea. I think from an either competitor or adversarial perspective, those are the countries uh, overseas that need to be dealt with, I think, more, more squarely and, and in a more cogent manner in order to have a foreign policy that everyone understands and that those who are willing to join the United States will, will go along with as, as we move through the administration. So, as a summary, you would say that the alignment is the same, the trend is going to be the same, the engagement, the way of engaging is going to be different. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, you know, look, it's justifiable. I don't think any of us necessarily disagreed uh, with the Trump administration, except at the very end uh, or the very fringe of this behavior that China is an existential
economic investment in investing in the Chinese market. Um, you know, China has internal difficulties uh, that for those of us who watch it relatively closely, understand that they have overcapacity in housing, overcapacity in manufacturing. Uh, their debt to GDP ratio is 300% plus, which is bigger than our own. Uh, certainly they have foreign reserves to offset that in, in, in almost equal amounts. But you know, at the end of the day, you're also starting to see some political divisions arise in China that could either strengthen, strengthen Xi's position as leader for life or weaken his position because um, he's beginning to break the model um, that Deng Xiaoping and others created uh, back in the late 1980s. If you recall, Deng Xiaoping, when he took over, suggested from an economic perspective, he really didn't care what the model was. And he talked about a mousetrap because it really doesn't matter which mousetrap you use as long as it catches mice. Well, it does appear that to Xi, um, the model matters. And so they're they're going more hardline communist from a political model, and they're clamping down on capitalism. You see that in the the failed bid for Ant to go public. Uh, you see uh, other activities that are taking place where uh, Chinese regulators are cracking down on large companies and and opposing uh, the creation of wealth for individuals um, like Jack Ma and others because they pose a threat. Uh, to the communist doctrine that they're living by. So I think there's some internal issues that may make China less worrisome in some ways, but by the same token, if they continue down the path they're on, uh, they're, they're, they're worrisome to an extent on the economic and on the military fronts. Do you think that, <clears throat> so it, this is interesting, so do you think that Europe is strong enough to kind of, how, how, what's your view, or what's the American view about what's going on in Europe? and? You know, we have the Brexit that has always also been, you know, kind of uh, freeze uh, for the last yep. couple of, of, of months. So how do you see, how do you see, how, how the U.S. see the European region evolving from here? Well, you know, it's funny. I think when Brexit first occurred, I, I was on CNBC that night that the vote came down and, and I predicted this was the beginning of the end of the European Union. And I think I was wrong. I actually think the union is now strengthening. And you see that through the issuance of pan-European borrowings and, you know, and bonds. You're starting to see closer alignments of government policies in Europe. Obviously, there are always frictions among European countries that, you know, those rivalries and, and those tensions go back hundreds, if not thousands of years or a thousand years. And so it's, it's, it's not by any means a perfect union, nor is the United States for that matter. I mean, our states have as many different behavioral issues as, as European countries. But I think as we move forward, we're beginning to see a strengthening of that. We're beginning to see Germany let up a little bit or loosen up a little bit on its um, concerns about inflation, its concerns about uh, borrowing in order to stimulate growth. And so you're starting to see more of alignment. Brexit it has become this odd outlier. And had there not been a massive disinformation campaign, which by the way, involved not just Nigel Farage, but Steve Bannon, who is ultimately a advisor to President Trump. Uh, with that kind of disinformation campaign, the single most Googled word after Brexit passed was Brexit, followed by European Union in Britain. So people didn't understand what they were voting for. And now we find ourselves in a situation where, you know, we're still in the midst of very, very difficult trade negotiations between the UK and the EU. One would wish that there'd be another referendum and, and, and wipe that whole thing out and, and, and effectively have the UK rejoin in some manner uh, the EU. But I think that, you know, I think we look at, in one sense, we look at it as um, an aggregated group. And the other hand, we do have you know, specific issues with each individual country. But I do st still think that the alliance between the United States, the UK and the EU is quite strong. And we will look to re-engage because uh, we, we share uh, philosophies, we share, you know, trade agreements that um, are, are extremely important. And we share concerns about the encroachment of both the Russians and the Chinese. So I think that relationship will tighten significantly with the Biden presidency. Okay. Now going a little bit to the market. So you mentioned, well, we, we agree that the U.S. and China are in the race for technology development. There was a big debate around big techs. So, 
And, you know, I think that the fact that Yellen came on, on board, it's kind of relaxing that concern. So what's your view about the agenda that the government will have related to these big techs and, you know, also the banks, the big banks? Yeah, I'll start with the banks first. I mean, it, you know, Janet Yellen uh, it was, was kind of a known hawk when it came to Wells Fargo's behavior, for instance. Um, their misdeeds of creating falsified accounts under the names of some of their customers drew very harsh rebuke from and penalties from Janet Yellen when she was chair of the Federal Reserve. Um, and as someone, uh, a banking analyst on CNBC this morning, Mike Mayo said, she's neither pro-bank nor anti-bank. I think she's quite pragmatic when it comes to her view of how the banking system should function in the United States, how they should be capitalized, how much liquidity should be available. So from a structural uh, perspective, I think she's going to be fine with the banks and that won't be her biggest issue. From a tech perspective, um, I'm not sure that's exactly her bailiwick, except to say that both parties have issues, not with large tech per se, uh, but certainly with social media and for vastly different reasons. On the one hand, Republicans think that social media networks like Facebook, Google and others uh, restrict conservative speech. And so now we've seen the development of an altern alternative site called Parler, which is uh, presumably free speech, but really tilts conservative. The bigger issues for both parties, I think, will become will come around monopoly power among the largest players. So that's Amazon, that's Facebook, and that's Google, and whether or not their component parts need to be separated. And I don't think there's a universal opinion on that because it's hard to understand what that remedy would ultimately provide. If you go back to uh, 1998, when Microsoft was under fire by the federal government for its behavior on, let's say, restricting certain applications on its software platforms, there were remedies taken that did not lead to the breakup of Microsoft. So there could be analogs here for investors when it comes to the likes of Amazon or Facebook uh, or uh, Google. Now, one could argue that shareholders would benefit from a breakup because if you got tax-free spinoffs for some of the more successful and lucrative uh, subsidiaries of each of those companies, uh, you know, you would have um, a, a shareholder benefit. I don't think that's the concern uh, of the of, of regulators and legislators. I think they're concerned not about monopoly pricing power, which doesn't really exist uh, among these companies. It does to a certain extent in the ad world, for instance, but they're really worried about concentration of ownership more than they are about monopoly pricing power. And in the US, monopoly legislation and regulation generally focused on whether or not decreased competition would lead to higher consumer prices. I think now it's a concentration of ownership issue that is being considered as a problem because it blocks competition, not so much as it has an effect on consumer prices, but it creates barriers to entry for new businesses uh, to crop up and stifles innovation. I think that's uh, probably a view shared potentially by both sides. And that's, that's where if we see any legislation or regulation or lawsuits, that's probably where it will come from. Okay, but before giving some time to, to Alicia to, to ask for some questions, I would like to touch on taxes. You know, we've seen a lot of migration of people from west to east <laughs> and from north yeah, to south. North to south. <laughs> yes, I know. God bless <laughs> you down there in Florida with no taxes. <laughs> so what, how is that going to continue? Is, is, what's, what's the agenda of taxes for, for the, the, the Biden and, and the party? So I think that's entirely dependent on what happens January 5th in the Georgia Senate runoffs. If the Democrats are, are able to uh, obtain control of the Senate uh, with a 50-50 split, but uh, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris would deliver uh, the tie-breaking vote, you know, using the budget reconciliation process, which is a quirk of, of, of our kind of parliamentary Republican system, if you will, um, budget reconciliation allows for large-scale legislation to be passed so long as it is deficit neutral. So you could see big spending packages that focus on relief and stimulus for the economy, infrastructure and the like be passed with a commensurate increase in taxes that would include a higher corporate tax rate, higher taxes on individuals making more than $400,000, higher capital gains taxes on individuals with an adjusted gross income above a million dollars. Uh, and, and that could happen. But again, that's predicated on the notion that the Democrats win the Senate. If even if they split the vote in Georgia and you get just one Republican winning, that means Mitch McConnell remains uh, uh, the Senate majority leader and virtually 
takes most of the tax increase risk off the table. Uh, maybe there could be a compromise on pushing up the corporate tax rate from 21 to 25 percent instead of 28 as the Biden uh, incoming Biden administration has proposed. Doubt we'll see any tax increases on individuals and some may see them anyway because of the quirks of the Trump tax cut um, have some embedded tax increases because various cuts sunset over time as we move towards 2025. So that, that's an issue with which they'll have to deal as well. But if the Republicans control the Senate, I, I would doubt very seriously we'd see meaningful tax increases. Thanks. Alicia, do you want to? Sure. Of course. Um, um, yeah, I have, I have several questions from our audience. Um, they are quite uh, market related. One of them is, <laughs> talks, yeah, of course. Well, and not, not only market, we also have one about Venezuela. Maybe you can start there. What do you think that will be the Biden's position towards Venezuela? That's a very tough call because we have not had, I think, um, <laughs> a uniform position on, on, on Venezuela for quite some time. I mean, you know, the, the Trump administration actually contemplated, I believe, uh, attempting a coup there at least on one or two occasions to drive Maduro out. Um, you know, as you heard recently, there was a conspiracy theory by Trump's lawyers uh, that Hugo Chavez um, had rigged the various voting machines uh, made by Dominion here in the United States to predetermine the outcome of the election. Now, the fact that Hugo Chavez died in 2013, I guess, was left out of that equation. Venezuela is a bit of a problem for the United States because, you know, you've seen an exodus of Venezuelans and, and, and you're seeing this in Miami, um, as, as many have left that country and moved to other parts of, of, of Latin America, Central America, and, and certainly uh, Southern Florida. Um, I don't know how we engage the Maduro regime in such a manner that behavior changes in a meaningful way. Uh, we may see additional sanctions uh, and, and maybe some pressure to move towards freer and more fair elections, but I, I doubt that's at the top of the list given all the other issues that we have to deal with, including China, which is a much bigger competitor, Russia, which is a more strategic adversary, North Korea and Iran, which have you know, nuclear capabilities. Um, you know, Venezuela in that regard is, is farther down the line, uh, I think on a list of priorities for the US. No doubt, you know, our diplomatic corps will begin to, uh, a as they you know, get their various portfolios, begin to deal with Venezuela on a one-by-one -one basis. But, you know, aside from the oil, quite frankly, and this is the way a lot of foreign policy has been dictated over the years, you know, Venezuela becomes less and less important from a strategic sense for, to the United States, because as we move towards electric vehicles, as we move away from dependence on crude oil, our relationship with Venezuela will, will no doubt change as it's beginning to change with, with countries in the Middle East uh, as well. So I, I doubt that's top of mind, although it's an important issue, but it, I don't think it will be among the top five things or even the top 10 things that a Biden administration will have to deal with right away. Thank you, Ron. The rest of the questions are much easier, I, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move uh, into, into the, um, the dollar, the US dollar. They're asking us, um, they're telling us that recently the dollar has been a little bit weak probably because of uncertainty. Uh, do you think this is going to reverse, that we will look into a stronger dollar for, for in, the, in the medium future? No, I think, you know, and, and it's both Schroeder's and my own view that, that, that the dollar should not necessarily crash by any stretch of the imagination, but it's certainly going to weaken. And, and typically these moves in the dollar are, are secular rather than cyclical. So the dollar from 2016 to roughly 2018 was overvalued. It's come down you know, double digit percent in the last couple of years. And this year it's been, you know, slightly weaker as well. When you look at um, growth rate differentials, um, they probably favor other parts of the world. Interest rate differentials kind of favor the United States insofar as we still have positive nominal yields versus $17 trillion worth of negative yields in uh, overseas sovereign debt. But by the same token, you know, unless the economy really rips to the upside, uh, by the middle of next year, you're going to see probably faster growth elsewhere in the world, possibly even in Europe. And, and, and to that extent, uh, the, the dollar is slightly disadvantaged. And we're also going to be borrowing a lot of money. So the Chinese have, have effectively stopped purchasing U.S. treasuries, and, and, and we've seen a reduction in foreign investor interest in U.S. bonds. So the Federal Reserve has been soaking up a lot of U.S. borrowings, now um, surpassing 
other countries as the single largest holder of U.S. Treasury. So we're monetizing our own debt, which typically also leads to a slightly weaker dollar. So I, I would argue that that probably um, militates for the dollar to continue weakening, not necessarily dramatically, but, but certainly consistently over time. And from a U.S. investor perspective, and it's something we talk about internally all the time, that also makes overseas markets that much more attractive to U.S.-based investors because you get that additional currency kick uh, from having a weaker dollar. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you, you are saying that we were, we are probably going to see a U.S. economy growing even if COVID is um, out of the way, if we if we get a vaccine and things go back to normal, you say that the U.S. economy is going to be growing less than the rest of the world. But do you mean less than China, less than Europe? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, look, it's 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 a bit of a crapshoot in so far as this is you know you're getting into I think individual and then aggregate behavior, right? So. Um, what exactly do we retain from this pandemic period that has altered our work and life behavior? We don't go out as much. We don't congregate as closely as we used to. Um, we don't go into the office as frequently. I think some of those features may stick. However, from a leisure perspective, I, I would imagine uh, there'll be so much pent up demand by next summer if, if people take the vaccine. And there's a big question about the US in that regard that people are um, not just the anti-vaxxer community, but but those who are skeptical of the speed with which this vaccine has been developed may be increasingly reluctant to take it. So if you have less than 50% of the population uh, being inoculated, you have some issues with respect to how fast we can grow because you could see another surge of the pandemic if not enough people are vaccinated or have already had the illness. Um, I, there will be an explosion in growth in the U.S. Uh, the day we decide that things are safe and normal. And that will more focus, I think, more likely focus on leisure and social activities than and shopping and things like that than it will on business activity. Because I think some businesses will decide, and, and we talk about this at Schroeder's, about how often we're required to come into the office. So if you reduce, let's say, your office presence by 40% or two days a week, um, that's going to have an impact on demand for fuel. It's going to have an impact on, uh, you know, commuting times, productivity, which has actually been a net positive of late. Uh, but from a social perspective, the minute we can go back into a movie theater, as much as, you know, all the big media companies are preparing for an all streaming world, people still like going to movies. They still like going to restaurants. They still like going to malls, even if we have too many of them. So, yeah, there will be a big kick in growth. But there's also going to be a long period of repair because the longer we go through this kind of winter of discontent, if you will, um, and the longer we have elevated levels of unemployment, the harder it is going to be to bring people back into the workforce and get towards full employment. So we have some specific risks in that regard that let's say Europe doesn't have. Germany is taking care of its people as they shut down for a period of time. And you see that effectively across Europe that there's enough of a stipend to, that they can stay home for the period required without losing any income. If Unless we get relief and stimulus sometime soon, that won't be the United States and that could retard economic growth even when we get to that point where we want to break out and, and, and be as normal as we were last year. Yeah, talking about the relief stimulus, uh, do you think that now uh, we, it's more likely that it will get passed, that we will get some kind of stimulus in the short term? Not in the short term. I mean, I, I don't think that uh, although Joe Biden is now pressing congressional Democrats to take a five hundred billion dollar uh, relief package. Sadly, the way it's currently constructed by the Republicans in the, in the Senate, it's not designed to go to aid the unemployed. Uh, it's really directed at other areas. So what we really need is, is, is something that we saw in the CARES Act, which is enhanced unemployment insurance benefits, irrespective of how people feel. Uh, about whether or not this creates disincentives for people to go to work. They got $600 a week for those who were unemployed, uh, even those who were furloughed, and even freelance workers got the money. And as a consequence, the savings rate exploded in April to over 30%, the highest level since the previous record in 1975. Now, that's been pulled down to less than 14% and people are going to draw down those savings over the holidays. So if we don't get anything by January and we have to wait until the Biden administration is inaugurated and sworn in, until we have a new Congress, this could be a very difficult winter 
uh, for individuals who do not have access uh, to their jobs and do not have access to sufficient uh, supplemental income. And, and that could be problematic. I don't necessarily think it's going to happen, and it's a relatively low risk probability that at this point that we'll see something major. We could see a smaller scale package get passed in this lame duck session, but I'm not sure it will have the intended effect of supporting people's income as they shelter in place and work from home through the winter. Absolutely. Um, going back to, to COVID, we also have a question about the distribution efforts for the United States. <laughs> do we have any clue what's going to happen um, with, with the new ad administration? Do they have like a think tank already in deciding who is going to receive the vaccine first? Well, they, they have not yet been briefed by the Trump administration. This, so the, the, the transition was just officially authorized yesterday. And so I, I heard, heard one uh, of the coronavirus task members of the Biden administration on air yesterday say they had yet to be contacted by the existing corona task force. And so we don't know what the Trump administration had planned with respect to storage and distribution of the vaccine. And as you know, Pfizer, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine has to be stored at minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit. The Moderna vaccine, um, a little less so and has a longer shelf life at, at much higher temperatures. The GlaxoSmithKline, I'm sorry, the AstraZeneca vaccine can be stored in regular refrigeration, but we, again, we don't know what the efficacy of that really is. Um, so until the Biden administration knows, none of the rest of us know, uh, because the Trump administration is not telling us in the media exactly what their plans were for distribution, other than it's likely that the military will be deployed in some manner and, and obviously they need special refrigerated trucks, they need special storage facilities for these vaccines um, because there's a very short lifespan uh, of some of them uh, to, to be uh, distributed and, and actually used. So we're not sure. I mean, I suspect that Ron Klain, who, was, uh, who is now uh, chief of staff designate for, for Joe Biden, who was the president-elect, was President Obama's Ebola czar during that outbreak. And so he is pretty skilled and pretty experienced in uh, these types of pandemic crises. And so I think we'll have solid leadership there and they'll take what they can from the Trump administration from an infrastructure perspective and hopefully build on that so that the distribution of the vaccine will be efficient. Now it's gonna go in the following order as far as we know. It will be frontline healthcare workers, it will be workers within nursing homes and senior citizen facilities, and it will be those senior citizens and other high risk individuals who get the vaccine first before it's distributed more broadly to the rest of the population. Okay, thank you very much. Um, before we go into the economy, because we have some, some more questions about, about the markets, we have one about social and racial unrest. Do you think things will come down with Biden administration once and for all? Uh, well, once and for all, is it, <laughs> we thought that in 1969. So um, af after a series of race riots in the United States and, and, and um, the passage of the Civil Rights Act, you know, prior to that, we, we thought we had, and I was a young man at the time, uh, yeah, I should say young child, actually, I was six, seven years old, uh, remember it clearly. Um, and this mirrors that experience in some ways, uh, although we've seen more corporate action than we did in the 60s and 70s at making good on promises to be more inclusive uh, with respect to uh, hiring, with respect to elevating people to senior positions, uh, to the CEO level, to the board, uh, that seems to be moving apace. Um, it may not die down right away, although the Biden administration, I do think, given the composition of his cabinet, which, as Bill Clinton said, when he was um, sworn in in 1992, he wanted a cabinet that looked like America. I think Joe Biden's going even considerably farther. The head of DHS is not only the first Latin American to get that position, the Department of Homeland Security, he is also the first immigrant uh, to be uh, installed in that position uh, once the transition takes place. Uh, Janet Yellen is the first woman, uh, female Treasury Secretary in the history of the United States. And we're seeing others of color who are being nominated to very uh, solid positions of power. So I think in that regard, um, the Biden administration will set the tone uh, for a much more inclusive uh, government. And that will then obviously spill out into the private sector as well. But I do think the private sector is for the first time in, in a meaningful way, 
um, adopting policies that will make a difference with respect to, to racial and, and social equity issues where that's not been the case before. Yes, absolutely, Gonzalo. You know that in the uh, asset management industry, there is uh, all this push to yeah. f through ESG. So, so everything is uh, going that way also in, in the private sector and for investors. Um, we have a couple of more questions. Do we have time? Yes, we can get sure, sure. Okay. I'm not going anywhere. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. So, and yeah. Gonzalo yeah. promised me a couple extra, a couple hundred bucks extra if I start. So. <laughs> Come to Miami to pick, pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So going back to, to the markets or the economy, uh, we have questions about protectionism, trade war. You've touched a little bit on this. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more um, and uh, try to connect with which sectors of the U.S. economy might have a positive surprise that we're not thinking of. Um, I don't know, automotive. Uh, area space. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Well, yeah, I mean, so we're, we're starting to see that already in, in so far as the traditional automotive business, which is now gravitating towards electric vehicles, you know, pretty dramatically. So Lordstown, which is a spinoff of GM, is focusing on electric trucks. And that's a stock that's been already embraced by Wall Street. And then you see a, a variety of competitors to Tesla that are coming up. Now, whether or not those are wildly speculative vehicles, if you'll pardon the pun, um, remains to be seen. But, you know, Tesla has done an extraordinary job in, in one, making <laughs> Elon Musk the second richest man in the world, but, but two, really breaking a stranglehold on an auto industry that had been very reluctant to embrace change. And now they're doing so at breakneck speed. So, you know, people have been focusing on the auto industry, the suppliers, those who are in the supply chain of creating electric vehicles. That's not so much a surprise as it is a continuation of a trend as much as it was in, in many ways opposed by the Trump administration to modernize the automobile industry, so much so that we become decreasingly reliant on uh, oil and, and, and other forms of, of, of carbon-based energy, that's a trend that I think that will persist. Um, obviously, it seems to me that infrastructure is going to be an area. And, and again, we've already seen some of those companies move pretty dramatically on the notion that a, that a Biden administration, and again, there's some bipartisan support for this, will focus on uh, repairing roads and bridges and engage in uh, other uh, priority policies that will drive some sort of infrastructure improvement. And, and again, the one conversation in the U.S. that we have not had is what do we mean by infrastructure? On the one hand, it's great to build new roads and bridges because if you live where I live, you, know, you have potholes that you could lose a car in. And so, you know, it's, it's truly a horrific experience to drive around New Jersey and New York unlike Miami, for instance. Um, but we also haven't really talked about what the infrastructure of the future will look like when we're utilizing much more uh, bandwidth because of events like these and work from home or shelter in place types of uh, events. Um, road construction, if you look at Northern Europe, is far more advanced than it is here in the United States. Their roads last three times longer than our own with much harsher winters. So we haven't had that full conversation yet. So I think as that becomes uh, more clear, assuming we have the conversation, there will be other opportunities that arise. And then um, some of this won't be administration specific. Some of it's just going to be the continuation of new technologies uh, that are being developed in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. And hopefully the Biden administration will provide an environment in which we don't lose ground on advanced technologies when it comes to artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, uh, telemedicine, uh, education reform uh, that's going to require uh, uh, quite a bit of, of work. And, and, and then again, just more broadly, healthcare reform and, and the expansion of, of, of uh, healthcare insurance availability and access. So all of those areas are probably going to be focused on as we move uh, through the first uh, days, weeks and months of the Biden administration. Uh, another uh, uh, another question about this. Where do you see excesses in the market at the moment? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. I was I was listening to CNBC this morning, and, and we've been talking about this for months now. So Jim Cramer um, was losing his mind this morning on on certain areas of uh, the market that are dominated by the so-called Robin Hood traders or the Reddit traders, the the new. Um, young individuals who have come in and followed people like Dave Portnoy from Barstool Sports who, you know, day trades in addition to his sports gambling uh, empire that he's built. And so we see, uh, and then we see this in every cycle. 
a group of novices who decide that they're going to make money trading stocks the way professionals do. And in a period in which it is actually quite easy to make money because the trend is so overwhelmingly positive, you know, you literally can throw darts. So if you've been long Tesla this entire period, irrespective of valuations, irrespective of, you know, any, any concerns you would normally have uh, about the outsized gains we've seen in the stocks, again, their valuations, the, the momentum trades that are being put on, they've been able to make money very, very consistently and haven't yet experienced the full-scale bear market. So there are a lot of speculative small names, microcap stocks that have moved uh, in, in electric vehicles, in hydrogen fuel cells, in biotech, um, in a host of different technology areas that at some point, you know, are, are going to collapse and they're going to drive these traders out of the market. It's just, you know, from my perspective, having studied market history in that regard, those speculative episodes that involve retail investors are often very late cycle phenomena. That doesn't mean that the entire market will crash. This isn't 1999. Those big technology companies that are doing well have cash flows and earnings that justify they're waiting within the S&P 500, however large it might be, unlike 1999, when companies had no revenues, no cash flow and no earnings and just raised money in the capital markets and used it to advertise a product they had yet to invent. So it's a different environment, but there are some pretty sketchy companies out there in the penny stock world. And then there are some wildly overvalued um, technology issues. Um, Again, you know, you don't know which ones are going to win and which ones are going to lose. Uh, my colleague David Faber this morning was saying on CNBC that in 1999, we were all laughing at Amazon.com. It fell 90 percent and became one of the most dominant companies in the history of the world. So you have to be careful. But, but there is a lot of speculative activity going on among these folks who, because they were unemployed, because they couldn't gamble on sports in the spring, switched to the type of trading uh, that we know to be wildly unsuccessful for individuals. So there will be a moment in time uh, where they get cleaned out and that, that will probably prompt something of a correction in the stock market. Yeah, this is why we need active investors and asset managers <laughs> like Schroeders and advisors, yeah. financial advisors to help, to help the, the investors, the clients. Um, well, you know how hard it is to talk to a kid, generally speaking, or a young person and, and try to impart um, any experience and wisdom that you might have, having gone through multiple cycles, no matter what part of life you're discussing with your teenage to, you know, twenty-something children, uh, they kind of blow you off as as having irrelevant experience until that moment comes that they replicate some of the <laughs> experiences you had as a younger person, and then they come and talk to you about it after they lost their money. <laughs> A couple of questions related to fixed income that is something that our clients you know kind of look quite a lot and um, mm -hmm. what's your view about the securitized credit market do you think that we are out of the woods or we are in the middle so i think it depends which part you're looking at right i mean securitized credit uh, from the perspective of having you know collateral uh, that backs the the loans is 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 first and foremost I think the most important piece of that and then you know as as you know our our colleague Michelle Russell Dow has done extraordinary work in that regard finding uh, those high quality issues uh, that have sufficient coverage um, with their assets versus their liabilities uh, to put together a good portfolio and so I think as an alternative to traditional treasuries, people are going to have to look in a lot of different places to find yield, whether it's securitized credit of high quality, whether it's uh, dividend bearing stocks that have uh, fortress balance sheets and are not at risk of cutting or eliminating their dividends. Um, and even some areas of the municipal bond market appear to be interesting, but, but secur securitized uh, in an actively managed portfolio where one can be nimble uh, I think is extremely important because we don't know yet of what, let's say, commercial real estate uh, or CMBS, commercial mortgage-backed securities, are going to do in this environment where we've seen uh, a great deal of forbearance, we've seen a great deal of um, delays in paying rents. Uh, we, we don't yet know, however, how that's going to play out among some of the big uh, lenders in that space because there's been a delay 
in recognizing the losses just as if there's been a delay uh, in demanding rents and, and mortgages. So I think, you know, you have to be careful, you have to be selective, but you also, again, as we discuss all the time, and this is a core belief of, our, of ours, is that active management is extremely important in, in the fixed income market right now because credit spreads have returned to pre-pandemic levels. So, you know, junk yields are in the 3% neighborhood. When I got into the business in 1984 through the late 1980s, junk yields were 14% and 600 basis points over comparable treasuries. That spread is extraordinarily narrow now. So as you reach for yield um, among riskier high yield uh, types of securities, you're also taking a, a, making a big bet that you won't see any principal declines. And I think that's dangerous. So I think looking at, again, uh, those uh, issues that have substantial uh, coverage uh, to, to pay the interest and then substantial collateral to secure the debt uh, is an important way to go relative to uh, taking much larger credit risk as you stretch for yield. So, Do you have any further questions? No, no questions. Okay, so I think we covered um, a lot of uh, things today. I want to thank you very much, Ron. It has been very, very thank interesting. You. Um, I want My to pleasure. thank Gonzalo. I want to thank Schroeders, of course, uh, for giving us this opportunity to talk about uh, U.S. politics. And, um, well, I want to thank all of you for joining us once more in a virtual investment summit. We are getting almost to the end of 2020, almost to the end of the year, but we still have a couple of things going on from here to December 31st. So thank you very much and goodbye.